So we've got the Commonwealth Games coming up and uh, the International Children's Games and they're going to be happening right on our doorstep, not too far away from the university. In fact, you might have noticed, um, uh, kind of as you came into campus, you'll start to see some, some pretty secure fencing going up around certain areas of the campus to look out for it during the course of the day. That's not because we have to kind of lock in our student bodies uh, at night. Um, it's because when the athletes who will be staying here on campus come along, they need to be in completely uh, cordoned off areas and secure areas. So actually, where you are walking today in several weeks' time, um, the athletes uh, of, of, of a similar ilk to those of the ancient Olympics will also be walking. What I want to spend some time though with you today is thinking about how, frankly, the modern Olympics, which are so claim, often claimed and thought about in conjunction with and linked to and as a natural progression from the ancient Olympic Games, actually might have been quite different experiences. Now you may all have some thoughts about this and I want to hear what your thoughts are, but these are some images that kind of conjure up in our minds right? when we talk about the modern Olympic Games. It's big, it's brash, it's celebratory, it's exciting, it's nations from all over the world coming together in a spirit of, yes, competition, but also it's a moment of unity, isn't it? We globally get together to join hands around sport and our joint celebration and enjoyment of sport um, while we compete and try and push, not just individually, but as a race, as a human race, to better and better and more extraordinary sporting endeavours. Anyone want to sort of throw up their hand off this stage and go, that doesn't sound like the ancient Olympic Games I've been studying? Anything of that kind of characterization of the modern Olympics that I've just put out there that you think, hmm, that doesn't ring true with the ancients? Anyone want to bravely put their hand up to suggest anything? Go for it. Absolutely spot on. So all this kind of flag waving of all these different countries, absolute rubbish in the Asian Olympics. The Asian Olympics are open to Greeks only, right? Now, that's still a pretty big world. It's the Greeks of the Greek world, right? And that covers everything from the furthest colony in the West, the Greek colony in the West, Massalia, modern day Marseille, all the way over in the east and modern day coast of Turkey, all the way to the coast of North Africa in modern day Libya, and of course, southern Italy, Sicily, and mainland Greece itself. But, kind of, actually, who within that world was Greek was a slightly more complicated question. If we put up a map of the Greek world here, we've got our, our kind of Athens, you might be able to sort of just catch there with some faces going across the screen, nice. Um, Olympia down here in the Peloponnese. Anyone on that map, this is just central Greece, like mainland Greece, but we are looking at one particular place on this map who actually had to fight really hard to make the case that they were Greek enough to compete in the Olympic Games. They were really always on the edge and often kind of threatened with being not allowed to compete. Who might I be talking about? I can hear some whispers. Yes, go for it. Maybe Macedonians? Macedonians, absolutely. Macedonians up in northern Greece. If you think, kind of hang on, I was talking about that massive Mediterranean world from France to Turkey to North Africa, and yet someone very, very close. In mainland Greece itself, Macedon kind of actually spends a lot of time having to say, yeah, we are, we are Greek enough to be part of the Olympic Games. And even the father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon, when he turns up wanting to compete, uh, not himself, but he's going to own the horses in the chariot races that will compete, turns up to compete, he's actually denied initially. You're not Greek enough to be part of these games, and he has to come up with some completely ridiculous, fictionalized ancestral genealogy of his family that gets him back to Heracles, right, uh, in order to be able to convince the authorities that he's Greek enough to be allowed to comp uh, compete. So these games in antiquity are actually quite exclusive, right? Not just not international, but for Greeks, and actually who makes it into that cut is quite um, divisive in many ways, shapes, and forms. Okay, so this is an ancient map here. Do please, don't worry about sitting in the back. Come down to the front if you guys want to come down to the front, rather than if there's not enough seats for you in the back row. Don't worry about coming down. You're okay there. Great. Um, so this is a, a kind of reconstruction of the site of Olympia. Who's actually been to Olympia? Anyone been to Olympia? A couple of you? Yeah, yeah, a couple, a couple. Right. Again, massive difference between modern games and ancient games. What are we looking at? What is the kind of fundamental thing we need to understand about going to Olympia? 
in antiquity, which is so different from going to the Olympic Games in the modern world. From looking at this picture, anyone want to thrust their hands up? This side's been very quiet. I think we need someone from this side. What are we looking at in this image? Don't know. Okay. You don't know. Right. What's that? Anyone know an idea? That building with columns. Anyone got an idea of what we might want to call it? Temple. temple. Spot on. What's a temple for? Assemblies. Assemblies and? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Religious worship. There you are. Spot on. Okay. So if that's a temple, then that other building with columns around it, that's another temple. And the smaller building with columns around it, just behind that, that's another temple. And we can throw in a few other religious enclosures and some altars that we're going to have a look at as well. So the overwhelming architecture of the sanctuary, the religious sanctuary of Olympia in antiquity, is that of religious architecture and ritual worship. The Olympic Games were part of a massive religious festival in honour of the god Zeus, king of the gods. That absolutely changes the entire context of competition between the modern and the ancient world, right? The idea that we would do the modern Olympics as part of religious worship, right, is an anathema to what we do today, but it was absolutely critical to understanding what the reality was like in the ancient world. And I'm going to keep coming back to this because we need to understand it wasn't just the architecture, it absolutely infiltrated every single thing they did during the entirety of the Olympic Games and was the entirely dominant thing that they were there to do. Right? Of all, the competition was almost a sort of sideline to actually the religious worship that was going on. So we've seen the temples, right? but if we zoom in on another kind of reconstruction, that's the biggest temple that we saw on the previous map, the Temple of Zeus. This thing, any ideas what this thing might be? I'm going to come down at the front here. Ash yep. altar. An ash altar, absolutely. So this is the business end. You can't go and burn things to the gods and sacrifice and burn them. You can cook them up inside a temple. You might burn it down. You do all the sacrificing and the burning of stuff to the gods outside on the altar. And you call it an ash altar. Why an ash altar? Because it's the layers of all of the hecatombs that were um, actually put, uh, from the sacrifice there. And they just kept it. They didn't remove it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is a really weird altar dedicated to the god Zeus, which had no official built architecture, so nothing survived. Right? We can't see it at all today, but we do have literary texts telling us about it from antiquity, and that it was made up of the congealed ash remains of every single sacrifice that had ever been made to the god Zeus. So every animal that had its throat slit, blood poured all over the altar, the body then cut up, the legs, the bones, the fat, all the stuff that humans don't like to eat, how convenient, had been wrapped up, shoved on top of this burning altar, and burnt to the gods so that they could breathe in the delicious smell of this stuff, and all the rest, the ash remains of the congeal had been left there, so that over time the altar got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time of Pausanias, our first kind of rough guide to the writer of the second century CE, that altar was seven meters high. Right? So, you can start to see this, not just temples, it's also altars that really define the experience of going to Olympia. When you were there as a com either a competitor or a spectator of these games, you were actually constantly coming face to face with religious architecture relig and ritual um, structures. And it wasn't just the altar of Zeus. This is a kind of 2D plan. Again, we've got our Temple of Zeus, that big one there. Altar of Zeus, that's the ash altar that you can see that we just had a look at. But you'll see a bunch of dots around that map. Every single one of those dots is an altar dedicated to a god at Olympia. Hmm? Now that map goes up to, what's the top number on that map? Was it 20, was it 15 or 17, something like that? Anyone want to have a guess at actually how many altars there were in the wider Olympic sanctuary? Are we going higher than 17? Anyone want to go higher than 17? Yeah. No? Go on. 32. 32? Any higher? 36. 36? Higher? 
53, higher. 67. 67, higher. 82, look at that, 70. 70 different altars, right, around the precinct of Olympia that all need to be worshipped on. Now, they're also not all to Zeus. Sometimes it's Zeus, sometimes it's Zeus with an epithet, you know, with a little term on the end which says what kind of element of Zeus's character are we particularly worshipping on this altar, sometimes to other gods of the Greek pantheon entirely, right? Kind of 70 different altars that we know that the Ileans, which are a group from the city of Elis, not far away, who ran the Olympic Games for most of its history, they have to go around and do a sacrifice on every single one of these 70 altars on a regular basis to make sure that all of the gods that have a place at Olympia are happy. Right? 70 altars to different, 70 different gods or different gods with different epithets kind of alongside all these major temples within a sanctuary and it's in amongst all of this architecture and different ritual structures that you're going to actually have the Olympic Games taking place. And we haven't even got to the weird stuff yet. Because, if I was to ask you, how did the Olympic Games begin? What might you tell me? Procession. Procession. Right, so, so we'll get to kind of actually kind of how they, they yeah, in terms of actually how they originated, sorry, I should ask the question. How did they originate? Who started the Olympic Games? Yeah. Pelops. Ooh, good. Okay, so we're going to come back to Pelops. Right? And we want to delve into his story a bit more. But there's actually multiple different stories told in antiquity about who started the Olympic Games. Anyone else? Who, who's another kind of athletic, strong looking kind of mytho individual that might want to have started some athletic games? Heracles. Heracles, absolutely. So some of the stories say Heracles started them, right? Of course. So that's why he was such a good guy for Philip of Macedon to relate himself back to, the ultimate Greek who began the Olympic Games. Some people say they began actually just out of worship for Zeus, right? Kind of, that was the thing. But Pelops and Oedemaus are kind of one of the key stories. Pelops, right, okay. Pelops actually gets a lot of airtime at Olympia, because in amongst those temples and those altars we've looked at, he actually gets an entire little ritual enclosure. So that little kind of temple entrance gateway with the trees behind it, that's the ritual enclosure of Pelops right next door to the ash altar of Zeus. And equally, when you go to the look at the Temple of Zeus itself, you see that pedimental sculpture, so the sculpture that's in the triangle at the top of the temple on each end. If we zoom in, these are the two scenes that are shown. One's a centauromachy, so it's kind of centaurs uh, versus lapis. It's a story of civilization versus barbarism, right? They get drunk, they behave badly, humans, civilized lot, fight back. Okay, easy story to understand. The one at the top, on the other hand, is the story of Pelops and another guy called Oinomaos. Now, Pelops is quite a, a kind of, you know, he's, 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 he's had a tough childhood, right? He's already been sort of um, cut up and sort of fed to kind of his family and then kind of, you know, been put back together again and he's had a bit of a love affair with the god Poseidon, you know, it's all good. He's now kind of coming into adulthood and he's, you know, wanting to prove himself. Oinomaos is a king who has a beautiful daughter, Hippodamia. Oinomaos, also beloved of the gods, beloved of Ares, the god of war. He's got some pretty fast horses and chariots given him by the god as well. And he's had a oracular pronouncement that he might end up being killed by his daughter's husband. He's thus not keen for his daughter to marry anyone. But he can't come out and be open about that. So he sets up a challenge. He says, look, anyone who can beat me in a chariot race can marry my daughter. But he's got horses given to him by the gods that are pretty, pretty fast. Thirteen in some stories, eighteen in another, suitors of his daughter come and challenge him in the chariot race and lose to him. Oh, and by the way, if they lose to him, he gets to cut their heads off. So, eighteen suitors, challenged, lost, died. Along comes Pelops with a cunning plan. So he's got some fast horses given to him by the god Poseidon. That's good, but it's not enough. So he bribes the chariot driver, or the chariot driver, the sort of manager of the horses of Oinomaos, to replace the axle pins on his chariot wheels and take out metal ones and put in some made of beeswax. So that when the chariot starts off, it's all fine, it's fine, but as the wheels heat up, the beeswax melts, the wheels come off, Oinomaos gets chucked from his own chariot and gets trampled to death by his own horses. 
Fabulous. <laughs> Pelops marries Hippodamia, and they go off into the sunset. Anyone? And then, and then supposedly, in some stories, Pelops founds the Olympic Games in honour of dead Oenomalos, the guy he basically killed, who was trying to kill him. Or in some other stories, Pelops, when he eventually dies, the games are founded in his honour, right? And that's why there's an enclosure worshipping him in the ground. Anyone got any issues or problems with that as the founding story of the Olympic Games? One that's so important, it's even in the pedimental sculpture of the Temple of Zeus. Anyone got an issue? Got any problems? Hang on two seconds. Anyone? Anyone on this side? Anyone? Is, you know, you happy with that as a foundation story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <coughs> what might you're shaking your head? You're shaking your head. Why are you shaking your head? You just seem like you're going to say something else. Okay. <laughs> so you're like shaking your head, going, "Oh God, please don't let him say anything else. Please let it be over already." Right. It's not great sportsmanship. What's Pelops effectively done in order to win? Cheated. Cheated, yes. Okay, how happy are we with the idea that the founding story of the Olympic Games is actually a story of a guy who cheats in order to win? Now, we might say, okay, yeah, but the, you know, the, the dad was cheating as well, wasn't he? I mean, he was cheating as well, so everyone was cheating here, so kind of all fair in love and war. The cheating story gets a little bit nastier though on Pelops' side when we realise what did he promise the guy who replaced the axle pins? He promised him first night with Hippodamia in bed. Post actually having changed out the axle pins, he didn't want to go through with that, so instead he chucked him off a cliff. And supposedly, as this guy fell to his death, he turned round in midair and cursed back Pelops, going, I curse you and your family for all eternity. Right. Pelops has a lovely life. He marries Hippodamia, he's a great king. The entire Peloponnese is named after him. And also he gets the Olympic Games in his honour, and he's worshipped forevermore at Olympia in his enclosure. He's there in the pedimental sculpture, right? Pelop, the whole second day of the festival is dedicated to honouring Pelops. What a great guy. Cheater. Murderer. Right? How do we understand that as the foundation story of the Olympic Games? And wow, weird would it be? if we told a similar story about the modern Olympic Games. In 1896, Pierre de Coubertin, founder of the modern Olympic Games, promised first night with his soon bride-to-be to his rival, before murdering him in the dark streets of modern-day Athens, and then kind of continued on happily as Larry. We honour this brilliant cheater and murderer today through the continued celebration of the Olympic Games in his honour. How do we understand the Greeks being so comfortable with this story of a cheater and a murderer as the founder of the Olympians they continue to worship, that they do it so publicly and so proudly? What kind of world are we actually dealing with here in the Greeks where this makes sense? It's a really tough one to get our heads around. And one in which actually what really matters, I guess, at the end of the day, is winning above everything else. One of which the Greeks actually, the method you get there, it's okay. It's about winning. Think about Odysseus and the Odyssey, his metis, his cunning, his polytropon, his complicated, often devilish ways of being, still comes out the winner in the end. It's okay, he's the hero. Pelops is something similar. Okay, so we have done, and we've thought about the ritual landscape of the Olympics. We've thought about these weird origin stories of the Olympics and the people that they were worshipping to give us a scent, an essence of what the games were really like. Now let's get into the games themselves. Let's think about the experience of going there. Olympia, some of you have been there. It's in the Peloponnese, in the middle of the countryside. Certainly no hotels around it. 
Now there's a couple of ancillary buildings, you can see them here, kind of around. One of them was a hotel, possibly for the athletes, but it's built quite late on in Olympia's history. If we're thinking about the 5th century BC, the golden age in Athens, there are absolutely no hotels in Olympia whatsoever. Everyone's camping. Right? Any of you go to Glastonbury? No? I think it's, it's Glastonbury, but in August, in Greece, in 40 degree heat, and there are no port there are just the two rivers nearby, both to give you your drinking water and to go to the toilet in. About 40,000 of you camped out in tents, you brought also your animals that would have been carrying all your stuff, but also some animals you might kill while you're there to feed on and barbecue up. Lots of people trying to sell you stuff, right? Lots of people trying to talk your ear off about their latest finding or their latest philosophical thoughts or their latest political ideas. Herodotus read his histories out for the first time on the steps of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, trying to get a good audience. Prostitutes milling around, selling their wares. This is the kind of experience of ancient Olympic games for the spectators. What have they gone through this for? What have they come here for? Actually, kind of because it wasn't a very pleasant experience. One of the ancient writers, Alien, says this. He said, if I want to punish a slave, I send him to the Olympic Games. Again, poster line for modern Olympics. If you want to punish your slave or someone, send them to the Games. It's that kind of great time. Right? Glastonbury, I think, would sell out with that kind of byline. Right? So this is, this, it's not a very pleasant experience, and yet people are coming in their droves all every four years to be part of this experience. And it's all about, for them, worshipping the gods and seeing the inherent competition. Now we're, about, we're going to talk about how it started off. You're absolutely right, procession and ceremony is how the games start off on day one. Five days. First, most of the first day is actually given over to ritual procession, ritual worship, right? It's all about religion. Then we have some contests for heralds and trumpeters. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting, really, does it? And one of the connections between the ancient and modern games is that actually they could, just like every hoster of a modern game gets to add a new event, which then becomes part of the games going forward, so too in antiquity they added new events over time. The contest for heralds and trumpeters came in about the 390s BC, so quite late on in Olympic history. Um, but it's there, like kind of on day one, and that it's copying some of the musical and dramatic competitions that happened at some of the other major athletic uh, competitions around the ancient world, like Adelphi, Adelphi, Ismir, and Amir. The then we've got the boys' races. So there were two age groups that, that competed at Olympia. Boys, we're not talking kind of pre-prep stage, we're talking about mid-teens, sort of your age actually, so you could be kind of, you know, in the short sprint, the wrestling and the boxing, and then there's the adult competitions as well. Girls, you're not going to get into the Olympics because male competitors only, but the Olympic Games, or at Olympia, there was a whole separate festival called the Haraya, in honour of the goddess Hera, wife of Zeus, where there were athletic competitions just for women. Does anyone know the one exception to that? Is the one woman who actually competed at the ancient Olympic Games. Anyone come across her name? Mary's and Whispers. Shout it out. Sai Niska. Wife, oh, sorry, sister of the king of Sparta. She secretly entered a chariot team into the chariot race, so she didn't have to compete herself, but she owned the horses who competed in the chariot race. She won, she put up an enormous statue of herself at Olympia with an inscription underneath it saying, a girl beat the boys. Ha ha ha, girls are better than men. Right? But that's pretty much the kind of only time the woman manages to make it into the competition. Day two, we finally got some athletic competition that we might recognise, okay? We're going for the horse events. You remember day two, I said, was entirely dedicated to Pelops, so it's kind of appropriate that all the horse racing, given the stories we've heard about Pelops, happens kind of on that day. And we've got the four-horse chariot race, we've got a horseback race, we've got a two-horse chariot race, lots of different kinds of races. So we have no idea that where these races took place. You need a massive hippodrome to be able to race the horses, and we haven't discovered that archaeologically. We know it's somewhere near the Olympic site, but actually we haven't really been able to find it yet. Now these uh, chariot races, who owns horses? Who do you think you have to be to own racehorses in antiquity? 
Rich, absolutely rich, 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 rich. These are races for the elites, right? The elites. So if again, if you've got any head things you have, I think it's you know, everyone's equal, kind of all, you know, kind of all about the best sport team, wherever you've come from, whatever background, etc. Entry Olympics, rubbish. In the chariot racing, it was about how rich you were and how many horses you could afford, the best horses you could afford to race. And we have a character in Athens called Alcibiades, who was a really annoying, rich Athenian, that we kind of everyone either loved him or hated him. Uh, and he, in one particular chariot race, the chariot race in 416, entered seven different sets of horses. Right? Just to show off how, that's not seven, is it? Seven different sets of horses to show off how rich he was. And his horses got first, second, and fourth place. Right? Kind of, I mean, what? Well, I mean, right? um, kind of certainly kind of someone who wanted to show off. Um, okay, so we've done the horse racing, and then we have the pentathlon. Again, ooh, we actually have a connection here with the modern Olympic Games. Pentathlon and the ancient Olympic Games both had pentathlon. Discus, long jump, javelin, short sprint, and wrestling, except the long jump was actually done with weights, so they sort of throw the weights forward to make themselves go faster, and they do it to music as well. Again, we'd love to see some of the modern long jump people try to do that. In the evening, more religious ceremonies, then we've got the running races as part of the pentathlon, and we've got the kind of the wrestling as well that's all in there. Day three, stop! No more competition! Back to religion, entirely. The whole third day of the Olympics is dedicated to sacrifice to Zeus. This is the big moment. This is where that ash altar comes into play. A hundred, you said mentioned a hecatome, that's a hundred cows or oxen. Just imagine for a second, a hundred cows or oxen. Have you ever been in the presence of a hundred cows or oxen? No. A hundred of them have been brought to Olympia. They haven't just magically turned up on the morning. They've got to be stored somewhere, right? So among those 40,000 people, when you've got a hundred cows, you need to be fed. They're all shitting like crazy. <laughs> They're all tied up near, we found actual kind of tie points for animals in the, so the around the Temple of Hera area, and coming down towards the Temple of Zeus. They're all tied up. They're all going to have their throats slit. Yay! Blood of a hundred cows. Oxen spilling everywhere. One of the 70 altars at Olympia was dedicated to Zeus with the epithet Apumoyos, which translates from the ancient Greek as Zeus, swatter of flies. It's August, it's 40 degrees, you're suddenly spilling blood of 100 cows over the ground, of course there's going to be flies. Supposedly, if they put lots of kind of good offerings on the Zeus, swatter of flies altar, the flies all stayed on the opposite bank of the river and never came near. Right? So they've, they've slaughtered these 100 cows, they're then cutting up these 100 cows, they're burning, their bones wrapped in fat and gristle on that ash altar to the gods, and that leaves an awful lot of what? Have you ever cut up a cow? <laughs> You've taken away the bones, the fat, the gristle, the meat. A lot of meat. 100 cows, if you talk to a butcher, 100 cows, if you're using every edible piece of meat on the cow, and you assume about six, seven pounds of meat per person, 100 cows can feed 50,000 people. So then Olympia gets turned into a, from this to this, an enormous barbecue. Right? Pits everywhere around the sanctuary, barbecuing all the meat that is left over from these 100 cows, for everyone will then spend the rest of the day feasting on. Entire third day. All in honour of the gods. It's all a mass meal for everyone who's come to be part of Olympia. Finally, we get to day four and we get the rest of the kind of races. We get the running races, we get the wrestling and the boxing, we get the pancration, uh, and we'll get the even weirdest of the lock race, the hoplitodromos race. Say, try saying that after you had eight ounces of meat and several canisters of wine. The running races, uh, they happen over short lengths, but only up to about 4.5 kilometers. That was the longest race the ancients did. The marathon, part of the modern Olympics, nothing to do with the ancient Olympics whatsoever. Um, move on to the boxing, and then my favorite ancient vase painting ever, because look at all the blood spurting from this guy's nose. Right? And we want to get back to this idea of the competitive, the uber-competitive nature, the fact that winning at any cost is what matters. 
This is a description I'm about to read you of a boxing match at Olympia that's recorded to us for, by through Theocritus' idol. Two guys fighting, one called, one called Polyduces, one called Amicus. The towering man swayed on his feet now, drunk with the punches and spitting dark blood, and all the spectators were cheering. They could see the dark cuts around his mouth and his jaws, and how his eyes were narrowing, how his face swelled with bruises. Polyduces kept on confusing him, fainting and lunging in every direction. When he knew his rival was utterly helpless, he landed a blow where the nose meets the eyebrows and exposed all the bone of his forehead. Abacus crashed back into the leaves of the earth. Blood was belching from his gaping temple. Polyduce smashed his opponent's mouth. Teeth rattled loose. Again and again, he landed his punches ever more heavy. He pummeled the face so that the cheeks caved in. Then at last, at that point, was he declared the winner. That's what was to be expected from a boxing match. That's the kind of competition people came and spent all that time sitting in a tent in that dusty Glastonbury of ancient Greece to see. And that wasn't even the half of it. Once the boxing was over, you move on to the Pancration, the all-power event, in which there were only two rules. You're not supposed to kill the other person. And you can't gouge their eyes out. But clearly, people didn't pay much attention to that rule. So you can see in this last painting, someone's about to gouge the other person's eyes out. There's a judge over here, kind of with a stick, he's about whacking for it. So don't do that, naughty boy. Right. Here's a, an account of a particularly famous Pancration match in 564 BC at Olympia, and it tells you again what they valued. Right. Arachion, one of the fighters, came hoping for his third victory, but his opponent got hold of his throat and started strangling him. Perfectly fair in the world. Pancration goes on until one person surrenders. Right. Arachion's being strangled to death, asphyxiated. He doesn't surrender. Instead, he can't get out of the hold, but he grabs his opponent's foot and breaks it in half and starts to rub the pieces of it backwards and forwards against one another to try and get the guy so distracted he might loosen up. Just as that guy goes, I can't take the pain in my foot anymore, puts his hand up to surrender, Arachion dies from asphyxiation of the strangled throat. <laughs> Who's declared the winner? The dead guy. They pick him up, they put a crown on his head, they carry him through the streets of Olympia, he wins. Because he didn't surrender. Men died, that's immaterial. He's the winner, <laughs> he's the hero, because he didn't surrender. That's what they're looking for in the ancient Olympic Games. Um, and then you've got this Hoplit or Dromos race that was introduced in about the 520s. I think this is one of those moments when they introduced a race and then for several years it made sense and then afterwards it just started to feel a bit weird. Hoplit or Dromos means running race in hoplite armour, but they only carry certain bits of hoplite armour, the shield, the helmet, the greaves, the rest of it, the, they're naked. Weird soldier practice, right, to run around with half your armour and be naked in a running race, right? But this was kind of, you know, started. And there are a couple of examples also of races that they start in the Olympics, and then literally about a decade later they go, what were we thinking? And they take it out again, right? Um, so that does also happen. What happens if you won, right? We'll come to day five in a second just to finish up. But just thinking about how people were, that set spirit of competition, right? You won. You didn't surrender. You were the winner. There was only the prize for the first place. There weren't prizes given for second, third, fourth place. No. Winner is everything. What happens? Well, actually, lots of different city-states of ancient Greece celebrated victors in different ways. If you went back to uh, you know, Acrogas, Monte Agrigento in Sicily, we know of one winner who was escorted back into his city in a procession of 300 white horses. If you go to Athens, don't have to go to Athens, you get a bit of money, you get uh, free meals for life in the city dining hall, and you get nice seats in the theatre. What do you think you get if you win in Sparta? Do you think they give you nice seats in the theatre? What do you get if you're a Spartan and you go back, I won at the end of games! Nothing, not quite nothing. You get, the next time the Spartans go to battle, to stand in the front row 
next to your king. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. Right. So different victories are recorded. You know, the victory is all important, but how that victory is reflected depends on how the different city-states configure themselves and think about what's important. Day five, athletics is over. Another religious ceremony. Way! And they're finishing off parties. Hopefully over the five days you realise that actually sport's one of the minor things that is actually happening at the ancient Olympics um, as you go through. And if I've got two minutes, I just want to sort of add two sort of further thoughts um, to how we should understand Olympia. It's all again around that sense of intent, accepting and wanting that intense, brutal competition that was such an inherent part of the ancient Greek world. Right, so we've seen our map of Olympia, you're familiar with this now, it's fine. If I then show you this, uh, this one, so we had athletic statues. So around the temples and the buildings, there's lots of athletic statues and statues that are put up, right? Some of them are of winning athletes. This is a guy famous on the Dory Forest. But if you were to talk to a doctor or a medical expert of human anatomy, and you asked him about the iliac crest muscle, which is the muscle that comes down from his sides, kind of across the front, and you could look around the back, he goes around to meet the base of his spine at the back, he would tell you that however much you go to the gym, that is a physical impossibility of human anatomy. So the sculptures that they created of their winners weren't just of really good looking fit winners, they were of uber perfect, beyond humanly possible winners. So they were surrounding themselves with imagery of literally of heroes, of mythical heroes that they could never actually possibly be in real life. But there are lots of other types of sculptures at Olympia, uh, not just of athletic victors. There are things like this, which is a figure of Nike, goddess of victory, um, that was put up by a group called the Messenians and the Naupactians because they had a military victory in battle against the Spartans. If you think about it, you're in a world, there's no internet, there's no TV, there's no radio, there's no social media. How do you get your message out there about something amazing you've achieved? You go and put up a monument at a place where you know lots of people are going to come to on a regular basis. So people, when they had a victory in battle, wanted to shout about it, put up a monument to that victory at a place like Olympia, and do all good. So Greeks are showing off and celebrating their victories against other Greeks at the site where all Greeks come together to compete intensely for first place. So it's not just athletic competition that they're surrounded by when they come here as spectators, it's also the day-to-day -day military aggression that signifies, that is kind of the hallmark of the Greek world that spends most of its time at war with one another. And my final thought for you is this. This map shows you the stadium, tracks one, two, where they do all the running races. All these little dots are all wells that were dug for each Olympics to provide water. At the end of the Olympics, they filled them with rubbish and stuff that got a bit broken and damaged. We excavate these wells, and what do we find? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. Helmets. Now, these are all Greek helmets from different city-states, but they're all Greek. And what we think was happening was that there were wooden posts put up all around Olympia, particularly in the stadium, where, again, the Greek army had had a victory on the battlefield against another Greek army. They would rip the armour off their dead opponents on the battlefield, bring it to Olympia, dedicate it to the god, and set it up on one of these wooden posts so it was there, kind of swinging in the wind, and then if it fell off and it got damaged and broken, it was finally thrown into the wells and put outside now. As they sat there watching these competitions, they had literally swinging above their heads the armour that had been dragged off perhaps their dead brethren, dead ancestors in battle that they lost, or perhaps the battle that they won. That was the level of competition that was on display permanently at Olympia, that infiltrated all of the athletic competition that they had come here to watch. And I want to end by just quoting to you what happens if you didn't win. Right. Talk about what happens if you won. What happens if you lost? You didn't come first. Because we have a quote from a guy called Pindar who wrote Celebratory Odes of Those Who Didn't Win, and he imagines what happens to you if you don't. No glad homecoming for the, the losers. They, even when their mothers meet them, have no sweet laughter from them or delight. Instead, they must cower in the back streets out of their enemy's way, bitten by disaster. That's what awaited you if you didn't come first to the Even your mother 
wouldn't want to look you in the eye and embrace you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.